you may have noticed that uh, the colors have changed up here again. We had white for a long time to celebrate Easter. Jesus has risen. He is risen indeed, and he is still alive. He reigns from heaven, but now we've entered a new season of the church here. It's the season after Pentecost. Pentecost is one particular festival, and then we're just kind of like, now we're after that. And we're going to be here until November, and the season after Pentecost is green. Green reminds us of growing things. If you look outside, there's green things growing. It's about time. If you look outside, there are gardens that are growing. Um, we have some herbs sitting in our kitchen window, and they're just starting to sprout. We're getting some basil and some other things. They're growing. Well, that's why the season after Pentecost is green. Not because of those growing things, but to remind us that we grow. As Christians, the season after Pentecost, we focus on our growth in God. And today, we focus on what our job is. See, today we're celebrating Trinity Sunday. We're going to see what God's job is and what our job is. And today we're going to be focusing on that. I'm getting a little repetitive. Let's sing. Um, we're going to sing our opening hymn, hymn 260. It's Trinity Sunday, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And some people get a little confused because they're like, Where, where's Jesus in the Old Testament? Where's that Holy Spirit? Jesus didn't have that name, but he appears lots of times in the, Old, in the Old Testament, as does the Holy Spirit. It's made clear in the New. In our Old Testament lesson, we hear an example of that time where all three peoples of the Trinity are mentioned by what they do, not necessarily by name. Our first lesson is from Numbers chapter 6. The Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron and his sons, this is how you are to bless the Israelites. Say to them, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. So they will put my name on the Israelites and I will bless them. This is God's word. The entire Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all work together to proclaim the same thing, that life comes from the Son. Our second lesson is from 1 John chapter 5. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. He didn't come by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit who testifies, because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three who testify, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and the three are in agreement. Now, we accept man's testimony, but God's testimony is greater, because it's the testimony of God, which he's given about his Son. Anyone who believes in the Son of God has this testimony in his heart. Anyone who doesn't believe God has made him out to be a liar because he hasn't believed the testimony God has given about his Son. And this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. This is God's word. The verse of the day. Alleluia. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. Alleluia. Out of respect to the very words of Jesus, please stand. In our gospel, Jesus talks about the relationship of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And notice, he isn't saying that we are all the exact same thing, just wearing different masks. But the Father is not the Son. The Son is not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not the Father. And yet there aren't three gods but one. Our gospel is from John chapter 16. Jesus says, I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he'll guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears. 
and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will bring glory to me by taking from what is mine and making it known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. And that's why I said the Spirit will take from what is mine and make it known to you. This is God's gospel. Grace and mercy and peace, all of these are yours. Because Jesus. Amen. What's your job? I'm not talking about your occupation. Each of us have numerous roles in our life. You might have the role of being an employee. I, in my role as a pastor, I'm not really an employee in any kind of conventional sense, but I've got certain jobs. One of my jobs is to yeah, preach a sermon. One of my jobs is to visit you in the hospital. One of my jobs is to uh, teach the teen Bible study at Oasis. All good things. You have jobs in your occupation, whatever that occupation may be. And a whole bunch of them. A whole bunch of different responsibilities and duties. But you are not just an employee. And those of you who are retired are probably going, okay, that's good. Maybe you're a parent. And as a parent, you have certain jobs. As a parent, I have a job to bring up my children in the fear and instruction of the Lord. I have the job to make sure they have that silly thing called food. Probably a good thing, right? I have a job to make sure they've got a roof over their head, that they've got what they need. I've got a role as a parent. I've got a role in an occupation. Uh, I, I think everyone in here, uh, we have the role as citizen of the United States. And that comes with certain jobs too, doesn't it? We have the role to appear for jury, jury duty if we happen to be summoned. We have the job of paying our taxes. In all our various roles, we've got a whole bunch of different jobs. Now, if you're a Christian, your roles are not the major thing in your life because roles change. I've had a whole bunch of different jobs. That doesn't change who I am. It changes my role at the moment. I wasn't always a parent. When I became a parent, I suddenly got a new role. But there's one thing that doesn't change as long as you're a Christian. That's your identity. And your identity is child of God. And if you're a Christian, that is your main thing. Well, does that come with jobs too? What's your job? It's important to know that. If you're not sure what your job is when you're an employee, you're going to get into some trouble, right? You're going to either take someone else's job or you're going to do your job pretty badly because you don't know what you're supposed to be doing. So maybe if you get a job as an employee, you get an employee handbook. You can open that up and you can read, oh, that's what I'm supposed to do. Okay, I got it now. Well, God gives Christians an employee handbook. And we're going to be taking a look at it today and asking... What's our job? We're going to go to the Old Testament lesson. And uh, there God outlines what our job is. It begins by saying, the Lord said... Okay, got to stop already. If you're a Christian and you read the Bible regularly, and, and Christians do, it's something that Christians do. We are in God's Word. It is very common, if you're like me, you go, okay, I've got ten minutes, I want to get these three chapters read, and you read and go, okay, done. And there's some value in that. You get good big picture stuff. But if you happen to have just 10 minutes and you read and you only cover two verses because you are reading those verses and you're thinking about them, you're applying them to yourself, you're asking, what, does the, what do these verses teach me about God? That is awesome. Because when you go fast, you miss a lot. And this is one of those spots. Three little words. The Lord said. That is shocking. God speaks. And he speaks to us. A lot of people say, well, I think, well, I don't care what you think. What does God say? We can actually find it out, because he says. And that's really important. I'm guessing in one of your roles, in one of your jobs, at some point, someone has walked up to you and said, what are you doing? You're supposed to be over there. You're supposed to be doing... And you answer, I had no clue I was supposed to be doing. Because no one told you. And then you 
get a little frustrated and upset. Husbands, maybe your wives have done that to you at some point. <laughs> You're supposed to be doing the dishes. I didn't know. Um, wives, I recognize, yes, we do that to you too. Maybe that's happened in church where you join a congregation and the congregation just assumes, well, you're supposed to know this is what happens. And it's really frustrating because, well, no one ever told me. Well, if no one ever told you, it's not your fault that you're not doing it, right? On the other hand, if they tell you and you refuse to listen, whose responsibility is it? Now it's mine. God says... If we don't listen, the responsibility is on us. It's not on God anymore. Because he has said, he tells us. So what does he tell us? What is our job? The Lord said to Moses, tell Aaron and his sons, this is how you are to bless the Israelites. Say to them, the Lord bless you and keep you. Eh, okay. Well, I guess we're starting with employee responsibilities instead of our, our employer responsibilities. Let me use the right word. We're starting with what God's responsibility is. What is his job, not our job? The Lord bless you and keep you. Oh, I think that's a pretty good job for God, huh? It's the Lord's job to give you good things. That is his job. I can live with that. I think that's a good job for God. Good stuff. It is the Lord's job to keep you. It is his job to make sure that you have everything you need for body and soul. Sometimes we call that big fancy word preservation. If you take a look up on our sanctuary, right over here, we've got this kind of pinkish diamond with a crown and a hand coming down from it. Notice the hand is open. That is a symbol for God the Father, first person of the Trinity. And the Bible often says that it is his job to preserve us. The hand is open because he's showering us with blessings. He's giving us everything we need. It is his job to make sure, he says to the trees, trees, provide oxygen. I kind of like that. I enjoy breathing. I assume you do too. It is his job to say to the plants, grow, provide food. And we get food. It is his job to say to every cell in your body, take in nutrients, keep functioning. He's the one who tells you, your body and the world, how to operate. So that you have everything you need for body and soul. Well, I think that's a pretty good thing. What do you think? Good thing that God keeps us? You're happy that that's his job? Amen? Amen. We got some amens. Okay, good. I think you're all liars. I just called you liars, that's right. And I'm calling myself one as well. And let me prove it. I want you to imagine what your emotional state would be if this happened to you. Maybe it has happened to you. You are in bed and you cannot get up. Something has happened to your body. You are incapable of getting up out of bed. Maybe it's a sickness, maybe your legs are broken, maybe your hips are broken, but something has happened that you are unable to get out of bed. And every day there's pounding at your door from bill collectors. They're there to take what you owe from them. Your bank account is empty, there is nothing left. Your credit cards are maxed out. Your refrigerator is empty. Your pantry is empty. You've used up all the favors you can from friends and family. They have nothing left they are able to give. And every day, people are pounding at you saying, you owe us. The power is shut off, the water is shut off, and soon you're going to be kicked out of your house. Tell me, do you feel good right now? Probably not. If you're like me, you're probably really stressing out at that moment. And I think I understand why. Because, you know, I, I would be stressing out too. Where am I going to get what I need? I can't take care of me anymore. My body is broken. What is going to happen? You know what you're doing right there? You're saying that it's my job to take care of me. That's why you're stressing out. If you're ever in a situation where you're stressing out because you don't think you have enough, there's one of three things going on, and really they're all the same thing. Either you think that it is your job to take care of you, or you think it's God's job to take care of you, but he's not powerful enough to actually do it. God can't actually provide for you. 
And if that's what you think, your God is not my God. My God is omnipotent. The God we worship here is all-powerful. He is able to take care of you. So either you think it's your job to take care of you, you think God isn't powerful enough, or you think God won't actually keep his promise to take care of you. You think that God is not good and will actually take care of you. And really, if you think that God is not able or he's not going to do what he's able to do, really what you end up doing is you're falling back on, well, if God's not going to do it, i got to do it. And that comes with a lot of stress, doesn't it? If it is my job to take care of me and I realize I can't do it, ah! and as Christians, that's really weird. Because we often pray. Some of you pray daily, and if you do it, awesome. We pray, give us this day our daily bread. God, give me what I need for today. We pray that. And when God actually does what we ask him to do and gives us just what we need for today and not enough for tomorrow, he'll take care of tomorrow when we get there. But when he gives us just enough for today, don't you stress out? I do. <laughs> We actually don't want God to do what we're praying for him to do. And yet God says, this is my job. The Lord bless you and keep you. It's his job. And when we try to take on that job, we're taking on a job that is bigger than we can handle. We can't do it. We don't have that ability. And God gets really angry. You have responsibilities in your life. And when someone tries to take them away from you, you probably get a little upset. Imagine that you're a parent. Some of you, it's not that hard. It's really easy for me to imagine that. Imagine you're a parent, and one of your friends says, you know what? I'm going to be the parent to your kids. You go do something else. I'll be their mom. You don't do it anymore. Do you think you might get a little upset? Think they might find a fist in their nose? Yeah. And with reason. But when we say to God, God, no, you don't take care of me. I'm going to take care of me. That's what we're telling to God. God, I don't trust that you're going to do your job. You go away. I'll take care of it. God isn't happy with that. It is God's job to take care of us. And yet so often we say, no, that's my job. That's not a good thing. Ugh. Okay. So God's job to bless and keep us, not ours. Hard to get through our heads. Let's keep on going. Maybe we can get to our job. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Okay, we're still in God's jobs, apparently. It is God's job to make his face shine on you. You know, I think that's probably a good thing, right? It is God's job to be in charge of his own emotional well-being. That's what, that's what it's saying. God, it is your job to make you happy. It is not my job to make God happy. And that is an awesome thing. I'm so glad that it is not my job to make God happy. Except I keep on stealing his job. Just like with preservation, I keep on stealing that job. I want you to imagine that God is examining your life. He's looking at every nook and cranny. He's looking over the entire history of your life. What do you think he's doing? What's the expression on his face? There's two possible reactions. There's my reaction. My reaction is almost always, God ain't happy. That is what I imagine when God looks at my life. God is angry at me or he's disappointed. And what is my reaction to that? When I see God disappointed, when I imagine him angry, my immediate reaction is, well, I gotta fix it. I don't want God angry at me, I gotta fix it. I'm going to do that by behaving. I'm going to spend more time with my kids. I'm going to read the Bible more. I'm going to, I'm going to feel guilty. That'll pay off some of it so that when I, when I approach him in prayer, at least I can say, well, you know, I'm guilty for this. I feel so bad. That's what I do. But look at what, but what I'm doing is I'm saying, God, it is my job to make your face shine on me by what I do. I'm trying to steal this job again. Nothing's changed. But I know... But there's some of you that have the opposite reaction. Some people say, God is angry when he looks at me. And some people say, well, of course God's okay when he looks at me. I mean, look at who I helped out this week. Look at how much money I gave. Look, I'm sitting here in church. I'm giving one whole hour of my precious time to give to God. Aw. 
but I'm not going to give more than that. Better not give 10 minutes of worship a day. That's, that would be, yeah. But I'm going to give an hour, and I feel good about that. But look at what you're doing, if that's what you're saying. You feel good about yourself. Okay, cool. But there's a problem with that, because look at what you're doing. God is happy with me because of me. I'm taking his job again. I make the Lord's face shine upon me. It's the same problem, whether you feel good or bad, when you think about God looking at you. You're saying, it's, hey, I make God smile, or it's my job to make him smile. I'm stealing his job again. Maybe you're sensing a theme. God has a job. We like stealing it. And we don't do too good a job of it. God has given a job to every human on this planet, not just Christians. Every single human on this planet has the exact same job. Old Testament says it this way. Be holy like I, the Lord your God, am holy. Jesus repeats it with a slightly different phrasing in Matthew chapter 5. Be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. That's your job as a human. Not even as a Christian, but as a human. I don't do that. I have failed at my job, and my job is too big for me. And now as Christians, you start seeing how ridiculous we are. Because we don't do the job that God gives us. And we say, I'm going to do the job that God gave himself. Woe to me. But it is God's job to make his face smile upon you. We've got this first diamond over here. That's God the Father. There's another diamond way up on top up there. You can see it's got some fancy letters and it kind of looks like an IHS. Those are actually Greek letters. It says Yes, which is the beginning of Jesus. Jesus. See, Jesus knew that we didn't do our job and he knew that we couldn't. And so Jesus did our job for us. He came down and he was holy, like his father was holy, and he was perfect. He did our job. And what's amazing is, at the end of his life, as he hung on the cross, what he said to his father was, wow, look at that mess over there. Yeah, I'm the one who didn't do the job. I'm the one who messed up. See that stuff over there? Look at that job so nicely done. That's what they did. Jesus said that you finished the job. He gave you credit for what he did. And then he said, yeah, I'm the one who messed up. I'm the one who didn't do the job. I'm the one who kept on trying to steal your job. Go ahead, punish me. Give me the, give me the employee discipline. Go ahead, fire me. And the Father did. And on that cross, it was finished. And now because of what Jesus has done, when God looks at you, he smiles. He looks at you and he says, job done, mission accomplished, job well done. Because he looks at you and he sees that the job is finished. He sees what Jesus has done. And he smiles and his face shines on you. And he loves you. So all those times that you didn't do the job you were supposed to do, those are gone. Jesus took that away. And every time you tried to steal God's job, you are forgiven and it is wiped away. And God just keeps on doing his job. He keeps on taking care of you. He keeps on making his face shine on you. And if you've been here any length of time, you probably could even say what the next line is. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. And we want that, don't we? we? We long for that peace. And we think it's our job to make it. Once again, that theme continues, right? It's my job to give me peace. I have to fix it. And God says, no, it is not your job. It is his job. You can see here, depending on where you're sitting and whether or not the cross is obscuring it, we've got a third diamond over here with a dove in it. Holy Spirit. A few weeks ago, we heard what the Holy Spirit's job is. The Holy Spirit's job is to point you to Jesus. He brings you peace by saying, look, I know you're stressed out because you think you've got to take care of yourself. Look, that's God's job and he's got it. 
Look, I know you're stressed out because you're feeling guilty and you think that it's your job to make God smile on you. But look, Jesus did it. And he brings you peace. It's God's job. And if you're filling in blanks today, I realize I've gone a long time without filling any because the first three are all the same and they were probably pretty easy. You might have even been able to look at this and fill it in without even going to the sermon. It's God's job to bless and keep you. It's God's job to get God to smile on you. It's God's job to make peace. Maybe you're sensing a theme here. Okay, next line. So what's your job? What's your job? To be holy, which is something the Holy Spirit gives you. We're going to start at the top here. First, stop taking God's jobs. If you are stressing out in your life, I want you to pause what you're doing and think about why am I stressing out. There's a lot of sources of stress. But I'm guessing that at least a portion of it is because you're trying to take something from God. You're trying to say, it's my job to take care of me. Identify that. Say, God, that's your job to take care of me. Do it. Maybe you're stressing out because you know that you've done something wrong or you're doing something wrong. You're not being holy. Go back and say, it is God's job to make God smile at me. Identify that. If you're stressed out, stop and see if you're trying to take God's job. Second, confess when you take someone else's job. If I come up to you and say, nope, you can't be a dad anymore, I'm going to be the dad to your child, you're probably going to punch me in the nose, and rightfully so. That relationship is not going to be restored until I walk up and say, I was wrong. I was way out of line. Please forgive me. I totally get it if you don't want to be friends anymore, but please forgive me. Do that with God. Father, forgive me. It is your job to take care of me, and I keep on stressing out because I think it's my job. Lord, take that job away from me and keep reminding me it's not my job. It's your job. Unless you think that I'm trying to encourage you to be lazy, to lie on the couch and say, God's going to take care of me. No. As was pointed out, it is our job to be holy. God has given us abilities, and we are to use those to his glory. And very often, not always, but very often, those abilities, God will use those abilities to take care of us. Not always. So yes, use your abilities to the glory of God, and he will use those to take care of you. So first, stop taking God's jobs. Second, confess when you take someone else's job. And finally, rejoice that God does his job. Rejoice. Wow, Lord, you blow me away. You make God smile at me, and I know that he shouldn't. And yet you smile at me anyways. You make your face shine on me. Thank you. Wow. And now some of you might be getting angry because you're saying, but wait a second, you never said you've got to do anything. You're supposed to be doing this, that, or the other thing. Well, if you're doing these three things, if you're rejoicing in what God has done for you, you're going to naturally end up serving others because that's part of rejoicing. It's not going to be forced. You may have to learn more about what God says, and I encourage you to do so, but you're going to grow and you're going to end up doing these things just naturally. So rejoice that God does his jobs. Grow in that. Connect the dots. God takes care of me. How does that show up in my life? Well, now I don't have to stress out. Think about how much energy you're going to have if you're not stressing out about anything anymore. Wow. No more worry? That frees up a lot of space in my brain. And now I'm able to serve so much better. I don't have to make God smile at me. So much better. Now God has given me peace. I don't have to worry about creating peace. And now I'm able to serve others. So Christians, stop taking God's jobs. Confess when you take someone else's job. Rejoice that God does his jobs. He does his job of blessing and keeping you. He does his job of making his face shine on you. And he does his job of bringing you peace. Amen. It is after Memorial Day, and I can tell. 
uh, thank you for making time today to come and worship your Lord. Continue worshiping him all week. Um, you got a plethora of inserts. I, I want to highlight those just very briefly. First off, June 23rd, if you like Texas Roadhouse or if you just need an excuse to go out, 10% of anything bought that night goes to Oasis, to our teen center here, but you need to bring the flyer with. If you don't bring the flyer, they keep that 10%. Bring the flyer and... Uh, Go, go to Texas Roadhouse there. I'm giving you permission to spend money there. Uh, I will have, I don't think this will be inserted again between now and the 23rd, but I'll have a pile in back. So if you remember, oh yeah, there was that thing, but we lost the sheet. The sheets will be back there. But here you go. There is our second annual softball tournament, which will be out at, held out at Shoreland. Um, it goes to support Oasis again. This is another Oasis fundraiser. Um, it is free to play, but they are suggesting $10 a player for, uh, for, a, for playing. Um, if we want to have a team at St. Luke's, or if you want to say, hey, I've got eight buddies, we can field our own team. Um, it doesn't matter if they're Wells or not, this is not a fellowship event. Make a team, call the number, um, I believe the number is on the back. Uh, there's the rules there so you know what's going on. Last year was a lot of fun. Uh, they're holding it to eight teams. So if you want a team, make it quick. I understand Bethany is, is going like gangbusters trying to get a whole bunch of teams. So there's the information. I don't know if this got into your bulletins or not. Cookie Day is Saturday. Uh, it's going to be a great day. We do this every Christmas, and we're trying it in the summer. Uh, we're going to gather, we're going to have a lunch together, and then we're going to make cookies, and then we're going to deliver to our shut-ins. And I don't know if we're caroling or not. I don't know if we're going to do a Christmas in June type thing, uh, or if we're going to sing something else. Uh, however, uh, we took a look at the funds that we have for this. We have enough funds to do a really, really bare bones cookie day. Um, as in, right now we don't have the funds to provide lunch, um, just the cookies, and we don't have any funds for any kind of treat afterwards. If you would like to, to help fund this, whether if you, you want to say, hey, I can bring 10 pounds of flour, I can donate that. Or I can donate uh, 15 dozen eggs. I have no clue how many eggs we need. Hopefully not 15 dozen. That would be a lot of cookies. Um, talk to Jen, talk to my wife. She knows what's all required for previous years. Or if you want to say, hey, here's 20 bucks so that you can do rip your floats afterwards with everyone. Um, again, talk to Jen. She's the one who's going to be organizing all that. Um, like I said, we've got enough right now, but it'll be really bare bones. It'd be nice if we can do a nicer day for anyone who comes. And if you want to come, we would love to have you. And in particular, we typically need drivers. We usually have a lot of younger people that can't drive yet. So if you're willing to come, even if you don't want to make cookies and you just want to drive around, um, we would love to have you. So noon, I believe. We start at noon. Starting at noon on Saturday. If you are coming tonight to refresh, or are you coming tomorrow to stories you should know? You need to know this. Starting at about noon today, the parking lot is going to be resealed. We are still doing Monday night, we're still doing the Bible study, we're still doing worship tonight, but you will not be able to park in our parking lot. I'll have the door down here into the kitchen downstairs open, as well as the far door for both Sunday night and Monday night. But just so you know, and if you know someone who's planning to come, let them know. Yeah, the parking lot's closed off, but we're still doing stuff, we're still open. And that should, really, really, really should be dry by next Sunday. So if the next time you're planning to be here is Sunday, you don't have to worry, you'll just have a very nice parking lot to park on. Um, speaking of stories you should know, phase two starts tomorrow. Um, I've broken down, it used to be a three month course, it's still three months, but I've changed it so that there are entry points in the middle. If you're looking for a, a chance to jump in or you know someone, you're going, hey, this would be a great chance for you to jump in. Monday is that first entry point, the beginning of phase two. So if you know someone or if you want to jump in, this is the time to do it. Tomorrow, 6.15. Uh, I know it's going long, I've got two more announcements. One week from today, we've got another entry point. We're starting a month-long series next week entitled, How Long? That question pops up several times in the Bible. How long, O oh Lord, have you forgotten me? How long are the bad guys going to keep winning? How long? And we're going to take a look at those questions, see how the Bible addresses them. If you know someone who's really wrestling with stuff, this would be a good week to come as we look at those things and say, yes, the questions you're asking are real. We're not going to tell you to shut up here, but we actually have the answer. And it's Jesus. 
So this would be a great opportunity next Sunday if you want to invite someone. And for this series, we're going to sync up. It's going to be the same subject matter in the morning and in the evening. So if you know someone that goes, you know, they'd be better in the evening or they'd be, be better in the morning, this is a great month to try that and say, hey, come on in. And finally, a week from Saturday, we're supposed to be doing Sweet Salvation, which is our new women's group. But I don't know if we're actually doing it a week from Saturday or for, or for d delaying till July. Has that decision been made? Decision has not been made. Okay. <laughs> That's a no. Of course we haven't made that decision yet. Okay. Um, maybe a week from Saturday, our new women's group will come, which is similar to Bible and Bacon, except for women. So you get your chance. Um, I'll talk more about that next week, and we'll know for sure whether or not it's starting in two weeks at that point. All right, join us downstairs. Oh, we got another announcement. Usually we've got other things that will will have a little bit more information in them, but I don't know why not. Just they usually just get saved. So. Yep. Let's talk one on one. You brought it up that we'll bring it up in front of the evangelism, our good news team. So we'll talk. But certainly the extras get saved for a month and then tossed if no one's used them in a month. So if they're going out, that's better use of resources. Yeah, I mean, yeah, still, still the garbage, yep. Yep. All right. Let's head downstairs. Let's grab some coffee and treats, and hopefully there's something cold to drink too, because I don't, I don't need the warm coffee. And uh, we'll see you down there. Have a great week.